Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, What Story Are You Telling? How to Think Like an Employment Attorney. My name is Stefan Adams, and I am the Senior CRM and Technology Manager at Validity Screening Solutions. I'm joined today by our speaker, Brian Huston. Brian, I meant to ask you beforehand, is that the correct way to say your last name? It is. Name? You nailed it. Perfect. Uh, a PDF version of today's handouts are available in... Uh, they're not in the file sharing section yet. I'm still new at hosting webinars, you'll have to forgive me, but they will be forwarded in the email afterwards. This webinar has been approved for one hour of general recertification credit by HRCI and one hour of SHRM professional development credit. HRCI and SHRM credit information, as well as a copy of the presentation slides will be emailed to all eligible attendees within 24 hours. Please feel free to post questions or comments during the webinar using the chat section. We will try to answer all questions at the end of the presentation. Now a little bit about our speaker. Brian is an employment attorney and president of Outright HR, a human resources consulting firm. Brian provides compliance audits, performs workplace investigations and assists with sensitive terminations. With an understanding that employment issues are best dealt with proactively, Brian creates ongoing relationships with his clients using flat monthly rates. All right, Brian, I've returned control to you and it's all yours. All right, thanks Stephen. And uh, thank everybody who's with us today. I really appreciate your time uh, this afternoon. So is I was thinking about what sort of uh, presentation to give today. First thing I thought of is, well, what do I like to listen to? Um, I like to hear fun stories. I think we all like to hear good stories. Uh, and then two, whenever I go to a webinar, I read a book, I listen to a podcast. Um, I'm looking for those two to three just golden nuggets of information that I can take and apply to my own life. Um, so what I did was I combined slides and information from at least a half a dozen other trainings that I give uh, to my clients um, and, and tried to take what are those big takeaways, those things that um, help me reframe how I think about HR, employment law, um, all of those things. So it might seem like we're kind of jumping around today, but it, it's with my hope that you get to take a couple of those pieces of advice and bring them back to your company, bring them back to your life. So I um, also need to give a shout out. I'm really honored to work with some great companies here in Kansas City. Pro Athlete just won Small Business of the Year, and uh, North Point Development yesterday got one of the best places to work in KC. So uh, happy to work with them. Uh, a lot of the stories I share uh, won't be from those great companies I work with. They're probably going to be from uh, some of the not so great companies that I worked with, especially earlier in my career. So I started out right HR about two years ago. I've been doing employment law and HR consulting a uh, little over six now. So uh, going to start out with, with something you probably didn't expect from an employment attorney and uh, take it all the way back. How, how important are stories? Um, you know, it, as I think about that question, uh, I'd say ask it to uh, a defense attorney, ask it to a prosecutor, ask it to a member of law enforcement, right? If a, a police officer rolls up on a homicide uh, and there's a person there with bloody hands, the story she tells those officers, it matters, right? Uh, in one instance, uh, she might've been a victim and, uh, and in self-defense and is gonna be able to sleep, sleep at her house the next day. Another instance, depending on the story, the context surrounding there, uh, she might be spending her whole life uh, in jail. So um, I, I think we kind of underestimate the importance of stories uh, in our day-to-day -day life, I would argue they're what make us human. Uh, one of the reasons why we developed communication. Um, and everywhere you look, storytelling content's taking over. So um, from Netflix to Facebook, I mean, Netflix is all storytelling, right? But I'd even argue LinkedIn and Facebook, right? My LinkedIn is look at where I went to school, look at the connections I have, the, the projects I've worked on. You're, you're trying to tell a story uh, with those profiles, um, and they're captivating. It's why people spend so much time uh, on on those social media sites. Um, but uh, we're we're here today to talk about work, so I, I need to bring it back a little bit. 
I, I told you my goal for you is, is to leave with some good little nuggets of information. Um, right when I started my career, a mentor told me something that has really shaped my career ever since. Um, he said, Brian, employment law is storytelling. What story does the employee have? What story does the company have? Um, and if, if the story of the employee is, uh, I've worked here 15 years, I've always gotten pretty good performance reviews, I don't know what happened, they just fired me. They're going to uh, make up some other story about why that termination happened. Uh, on the flip side, if the company can have the story of, um, look, we, we gave you guidance, um, we, we had these sit down meetings, we said if you didn't hit X, Y would happen. Um, you continuously failed to, to hit those objectives we set. Our hands were tied, we told you what would happen, and, and you continually failed. Uh, even better, if you can show that we tried to help them, right? We've been over backwards for this person, um, but they shot themselves in the foot and ultimately uh, this is what had to happen. That is a much better story and it's the story all of your uh, employment attorneys hope to get. They want that paper trail, they want that documentation um, and they wanna be able to, to sell a good story. Um, in, and in business, it is expected of us to have that documentation. And, and I know it's one of the harder things. I think there are a lot of HR professionals on this webinar today. Um, you guys know this. It's how do you get that point across to your managers? Um, so uh, the, the first half of this and really a lot of this training is going to be stuff that I give directly to those frontline managers, the people who, who are doing the managing day to day. Um, but you as HR professionals, your job is kind of the same as my job. It's getting those managers motivated, having them think about the importance, um, you know, whether it's documenting or just doing the right thing as a manager. Um, so I, I'm going to uh, try to move through some of this material a little faster because when I practiced uh, this, I was always going over the time and uh, I'm going to tell most of my stories at the end. So I want to make sure uh, we get to it and we get to hear some of those uh, more engaging uh, anecdotes and stories. So um, again, employment law is what story does the employee have? What story does the company have? Uh, and if you have the better story, odds are you're going to win. Um, so what is management's responsibility, what's, what's management's record uh, of doing their job. Um, as HR people, you might already know this, but only about 30% of our employees are actively engaged at work. Engaged means, you know, they're enthusiastic about the work they do. They, they enjoy uh, the work they do. They, they like getting up in the morning to come do work. Um, Gallup, US uh, News and World Reports, uh, they focus on how much this costs companies every year. They estimate about $450 billion uh, just because people aren't really excited about what they do. Um, I try and look at, at the positive here. Our companies are already profitable, right? We wouldn't have jobs if, if the companies weren't making money. Uh, but we know this is true, um, that, that people just really aren't that engaged at work. So can we get those numbers up? I argue that is management's responsibility. That, that's our job. Um, and, and if you look at that 30% number, um, Jack Welsh is former CEO of uh, GE. He, he used a model um, where he said, if you have five people on a team, you probably have one all-star, three in the middle, and one person who's lagging behind. Now, those three in the middle, they're good employees. They're, they're employees that we wanna keep, but can we get that engagement up? Um, and, and I'd say when you look at your teams, whether it's five people, 10 people, 100 people, that standard deviation seems to hold pretty true. Um, so I challenge people, hey manager, if you could, instead of just one superstar now have two or three, how much work would go off of your plate? What would that free you up to do, All right? What would stress levels in your department look like? Um, and, and I think it is a ripple effect um, that, that maybe we don't take seriously enough of 
hey, how do we increase this performance? Um, and then this bullet probably doesn't really go here, but it is the, um, the, the, the one piece of advice that I've gotten more affirmation and, and people coming up to me after a presentation saying, this is true. Uh, people join companies, but they leave their managers. Um, uh, I, I actually first wrote that bullet on a slide while I was on an airplane. The guy next to me leaned over, said, I hate eavesdropping, uh, but I just have to say how true that is. I'm flying back tonight from an interview. I love the company I work for. Benefits, everything are great, but my boss is a, he didn't say jerk, but I'll say jerk. Um, and, and I've seen it in my own life. Uh, my wife worked for a very cool boutique firm, uh, got to work from home, great pay, great benefits. They did a lot of cool things for the community and uh, for their employees, but her boss again was a jerk. And uh, you can only work for jerks for so long before you start looking elsewhere. So, um, you know, e even at the best companies, I've also done a lot of consulting with Boulevard Brewery. Um, they have a problem with this. Everyone wants to work for Boulevard, uh, but there are certain managers that it's leadership and HR's responsibility to try and train up. Because if you see uh, certain managers having turnover problems, uh, it's probably not the people under them, it's probably the management uh, style or, or techniques. Um, but I won't put the blame on managers for, for too long because how do most of us get managerial responsibility? Um, for most people, they're good at making widgets. So now we have you manage people who make widgets uh, or I'm really good at accounting and spreadsheets. So uh, I got promoted to team lead and then manager. And all of a sudden, you're not doing that job anymore. Your job is now to motivate others, to get good work out of others. Um, and, and really doing the thing that got you the promotion is a very small piece of your day to day. Um, and, and unfortunately, most managers are given absolutely zero training on their new role, right? If you look at Fortune 500 companies, they have some manager training uh, programs, but 500 employees and less, uh, you're lucky to get a one hour presentation, right? And we say, go lead and have good productive teams. Well, it, it, it's no wonder we only have 30% engagement at work, right? Uh, I, I do strongly believe this is something we need to take more seriously um, and put more effort in as companies. Um, and the other thing that I always tell managers is, you know, it's so easy. We all get in the weeds, right? Uh, we have day-to-day -day deadlines. We have um, people uh, not able to work for whatever reasons. We have uh, a lot of stuff going on and we just need to hit those deadlines, get those projects out. Uh, and sometimes it's really helpful to take a step back and think about if somebody told a story about the type of manager I am, um, what, what would that look like? What, what is that narrative? Am I the, the guy whose door is always shut and I respond with really curt, short emails? Um, that, that's gonna be one of those managers that people uh, are gonna wanna leave no matter how good the company as a whole is. Uh, so I, I know this is stuff you guys struggle with uh, probably on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. You have leadership and HR all in line with how we want uh, our managers to manage and lead. But when push comes to shove, those deadlines, the day-to-day -day politics uh, often get in the way. Uh, not to mention, we didn't give them the tools and the training to be a good manager in the first place. Um, so what do I wanna talk about today? Um, really two main topics. The first one is what does an ideal manager look like? What should we uh, be promoting to our managers of, hey, this is what we expect from you. These are the ideals we'd like to see from you. Uh, and then two, just common mistakes I'm seeing, um, you know, with, with clients I work with. So um, let's, let's get into it. First, I, I want everybody to just take a moment to think of the best coach or teacher you've ever had. And um, if I could see the chat feature, I'd ask you to 
put it in there too, have some courage and, and, and type it up, but um, I can't see it. So I, I, I don't know if you are or not, uh, but take a minute, uh, really think about somebody who impacted your life. Um, typically it's easier to think of a coach or a teacher. And I'll tell you, mine was coach Parks. Uh, he was a wrestling coach I, I had in high school. Um, I haven't seen him in over 15 years, but when I get asked this question, he's the name that comes to my mind. So hopefully you all have somebody in your mind. If, if I give this in person, I'd go around the room, ask at least 10 people, um, give me the name, give me the name. Uh, and amazingly, each one of us has a name. We all have somebody that we carry with us who helped shape us. Um, typically, you know, high school or earlier, those developmental years um, that, that really taught us something. So it, uh, I hope you all have that name in your mind. Now answer these questions. Was that person easy or tough? Were they fair or unfair? But did you know where you stand with them? So over 90% of the people who I asked this question to, that person was tough. They were tough, but they were fair and you always knew where you stood, right? I actually have had a couple examples of people who were uh, easy, but that's what the individual needed. They needed freedom and flexibility. For most of us, we need somebody who, who's tough. And, and I wonder why that is. But it's think about what those good coaches and teachers really did for you. For most of us, they showed us that we were capable of more than we realized. Right? We could do more than we thought we could do. Um, whether it was a teacher who was extremely difficult and you memorized more material uh, than you thought humanly possible, whether it was a coach who pushed your body farther than you thought you could or uh, had you run faster than you ever thought you could, um, you know, they showed us we do have that strength within, within us. Uh, but to pull that strength out, typically it takes being a little tough. Um, and one of my challenges to managers that I talk with is really the ideal standard of a great manager would be to be that person. Be that person for people on your team, be that great coach, that great teacher. Um, I used to ask this question with, uh, boss included. So the best coach, boss, or teacher you've had. Nobody ever says any bosses. Uh, and that's too bad. It's too bad because we spend more time at work and more years at work uh, under the same people. We actually have the ability. We, we could impact people's lives. Uh, we might have to be a little tough with them, but as long as we're fair, they know where they stand, uh, and we show them that they're capable of, of more than they think they are, they'll thank us. Right. Um, I said, I haven't seen Coach Parks in 15 years. Uh, I, I have a feeling I might tell my grandchildren some stories about this man who will long have passed by that point. But that, that's what it means. Th these people stay with us. And how great would it be as a manager at your company um, if long after you're gone, somebody's telling their grandchildren about this great boss that they had? Uh, in all, all the great ways that, that you challenged them and showed them what they were capable of. Um, that's the ideal highest standard uh, that I would ever preach. Um, the, the next one, uh, if, if we're going to bring it down to earth a little bit, and maybe you're not somebody who uh, sticks with people for 50 plus years, but uh, you should at least be a manager of the future. Um, I, I like to point out that what used to be tolerated in the workforce today, uh, or what used to be tolerated in the workforce is not tolerated today, right? Um, I wasn't around in the Mad Men era or nine to five, um, that movie's era in the workforce, but I've, I've heard and been told that work really was inappropriate a long time ago. The pendulum has been swinging um, and what we tolerate has been less and less. We expect professionalism at work. Uh, you go to work uh, to do a good job, not to be harassed, not to be discriminated against. Um, and our society is having less tolerance for that inappropriate behavior. Um, I think that's a, a great thing personally, uh, but even if you don't agree with me on that, 
you should still see it, right? When I give trainings, at least half of the managers in the room are close to my age, the upper 20s, lower 30s. You still have a lot of career left in you. And if you look at that pattern, we're going to expect people to be more professional in the future. Uh, less inappropriate comments, less inappropriate jokes. Uh, and you're going to need to be a professional to be successful. All right. Uh, I've, I've talked with owners of companies who have great employees, but they're afraid to promote them because they can't trust them. They can't trust that this person won't get the company into trouble. And uh, unfortunately, there are some areas of the law that have strict liability. So uh, sexual harassment, we'll talk about here a little later, but there are two main types of sexual harassment, um, tangible employment action and uh, hostile work environment. Tangible employment action used to be called quid pro quo. Um, there's no defense to that. It's strict liability. If, if I say, um, you know, go on this date with me and we'll talk about a promotion or don't go on this date and we'll talk about you finding a new job because you're going to be fired. If I actually fire somebody because they don't go on a date with me, there's strict liability. There's no defense for the company. No, it's what are we going to settle for? Or is there some other story out there that could possibly explain it? That, that's the position um, managers can put the company in. Uh, and it doesn't matter how great of an employee you are, how much you've brought in to, to the firm or the company in the past, uh, strict liability, losing a suit like that uh, washes it all away and you're in the hole. So, um, you know, business owners are aware of this now and, and you aren't going to get a promotion unless you can be uh, that manager in the future, someone who is more professional, who the company can trust not to get them into trouble. Um, yeah, I also um, harp on, uh, on my managers to take ownership of the situation, right? Um, the boss, the product, the economy, they're not to blame. Um, what's within your control? What can you do to help the company, to help your team? Uh, how could you help your team's culture? As a manager, that's really your job. Uh, motivation's difficult, right? Uh, you can be super motivated on Monday and come Wednesday, not, nothing left in the tank. It's an ongoing process. And as a manager, it's even tougher. It's not motivating yourself, it's motivating others, right? So try and find little tricks, little tools that can help you improve your team's culture. Um, you know, if you're not already doing little weekly team meetings, team powwows, um, consider it. It doesn't have to be long, five, 10 minutes. Um, I, I mentioned Boulevard earlier, they were having a problem um, that, their employees were finding out about new beer releases after the public because uh, the company was doing Instagram and, and Facebook and all those other sort of promotions. Um, the managers knew, knew what sort of beverages were coming out, uh, but it wasn't always making its way all the way down uh, the chain. And uh, that, that's what your employees want to know. Uh, if you have a position of authority, odds are you're privy to some information that they're not privy to. So um, have spending a little bit of your time, a little bit of your energy um, to tell them about it, right? Keep them in the loop. That builds trust, that helps the culture. Um, and, and it's gonna make it a whole lot easier for you to lead and, and for you to manage. Um, what to do when a subordinate fails. Um, some of this comes from Jocko Wilnick, um, extreme ownership. Uh, and, and he would say, well, if you're, if you're going to have extreme ownership, then first you need to look at yourself. Um, if, if a subordinate fails, you need to look at yourself and see, uh, have you given them the training? Have you given them the resources that they need to actually be successful? Um, you know, I get called into kind of managerial disputes uh, every once in a while. And I'd say nine times out of 10, it is communication, right? You think you've told the employee um, what you expect from them. But when I start asking, it's not clear to me. If it's not clear to me, uh, maybe you're, you haven't given them the training, the tools, the, the communication uh, that they need. 
Um, if you have, and if you know and are confident that you have, and the employee continuously fails to meet uh, standards, this is the toughest bullet point I go over with companies. Um, as a leader, you need to be loyal to the team and the organization above the individual. Now, I try and preach that um, people in, in your company should be like, like your uh, family. And I don't know about you, but if Aunt Lizzie is late to Thanksgiving every year, we don't kick her out of the family. Uh, but we've had addiction in my family. And uh, if Eric keeps stealing from the family, he keeps harming the family. Um, it, it doesn't matter um, the sort of resources we've tried to give them. Uh, Eric continuously fails, uh, hasn't made that decision to help himself. Sometimes you need to make that hard decision and, and actually cut them off. Uh, and, and that's how it should feel. Um, it, it, it's sad, but if you've done the right thing, if you know that you've, you've um, given them the tools, the explanations, uh, and they continue to fail, uh, then they're bringing down the rest of the family. Uh, and we need to be loyal to everybody in the pack. Um, and again, bringing it back to documentation, which uh, I know UHR people um, are, are on the same page as me with, it's key, right? It, it is key to telling that story of why we had um, uh, to ultimately um, let that person go or take these adverse actions, right? And I know you guys understand that, but um, framing it as storytelling uh, has helped me uh, get more managers who, who are a little uh, resistant to the idea um, to do it. Uh, and, and, you know, another thing is people say, well, what am I supposed to do with verbal warnings? Um, you know, I've talked to the person 10 times, but when I ask you, you can't give me the dates of when you talk to them or what it was about. Uh, just get your phone after you have a, a verbal uh, conversation, put it in your notes, put it in your calendar, um, talked with Brian uh, about attendance, right? It, it can be seven words. All we need is a date and a timeline and it's gonna help paint that picture. Um, so the easier, the better a lot of the time, especially if it's the beginning of this uh, process, um, but making sure that you do have that track record is, is really what's expected of us um, to, to tell that story on behalf of the company. Um, so um, again, I'm, I'm gonna try and go through some of this a little faster. What's it take to be a great leader? Being a leader uh, of the future, uh, thinking about the story, your management style is telling, taking those couple steps back to, to think, have I given them uh, the tools and explanations needed? Uh, being tough but fair and having high but clear standards. Um, I, I get asked a lot, how do we increase performance? How, how do we get people to work better? Uh, it's, it's not really a secret. If, if you expect more, typically you get more. Um, if you put up with it, you're gonna get more of it, right? So um, as long as you're fair, as long as you're consistent and it was communicated well, that's the easiest way uh, to, to get performance up. All right, so now we're gonna switch gears here a little. Um, these may be kind of common sense items to you in the HR field, but I can guarantee you you're dealing with them uh, as frequently probably as I am. So what mistakes am I seeing managers make? Uh, discipline, everybody knows that's a big issue. Same thing with performance reviews. Uh, you're finally seeing uh, kind of a shift in how do we even think about or talk about performance reviews that I think is probably long overdue. Confidentiality uh, and then harassment. Um, so uh, discipline, and I think most of you are probably familiar with progressive discipline, first written warning, second written warning, final written warning, termination. Um, the, the main thing that I try and explain to managers though is this isn't a punishment. We're trying to get people back on track. Um, we aren't trying to punish them or counsel them for, for being bad. This is, hey, these are the expectations. Normally you meet these. I, I don't know what's been going on. Let's, let's have a conversation about it and see, can I help you? Uh, what, what can we do? 
uh, to get you back on track to being that employee that we both know you can be, right? So uh, how should you discipline? Um, first in private, uh, a lot of my manufacturing or blue collar uh, companies have a bigger problem with this. Um, you know, somebody jams up the production line, manager comes out and just yells at them in front of everybody else. Well, what does that do? Um, well, one, you just humiliated the person, right? They already knew they screwed up. Uh, and now all of their peers are watching you berate them. Uh, that, that destroys trust. And those peers who are witnessing it, they also now know if they screw up, uh, they might get yelled at in front of all their friends and peers as well. So really, if you're going to discipline, uh, it, it should be in private, should not be in front of the rest of the team. Um, need to explain the issue, what's expected, need to be soliciting feedback. Um, this should not just be a one-way conversation, right? Uh, why why haven't you been coming to work on time? Is, is there anything I can do to help you, right? Ask what you can do to help them improve. Um, if, if we think about storytelling, um, if the story is this person constantly shows up to work late and the manager sits them down and says, hey, I'll call you every morning at 7 a.m. I want to make sure this is corrected. I want you to be successful here. I'll call you every day. Uh, or I'll carpool you to work, right? I'll, I'll drive with you and pick you up. That tells a great story because that's, hey, look, the company, the manager, we tried to do everything we can to have them be successful, to try and figure out what's going on in their life. Um, and and uh, if, if this continues, it really does help with uh, the story the employer is going to need to tell. Um, show them the write-up, have them sign it. If they want a copy, give it to them. I get asked that a lot. Should we give them a copy? Um, you know, you should be getting HR involved anyway, and there shouldn't be anything on, on the discipline form that um, employees shouldn't be seeing, right? This is a, a conversation with them. Uh, it should be perfectly fine to give them a copy. Um, if they refuse to sign it, get a witness email. I get that question a lot too. Uh, and, and let's go back to storytelling. Uh, I tell my clients, hey, if they refuse to sign it, that kind of shows this is a difficult person to work with. Um, I got a call today um, with an employee who told their boss, no, I'm not going to a meeting uh, that, that the boss asked for today. I have too much work to do. Uh, and I'm not going in any meeting with you in the future. I need a third party representation at beforehand. Um, kind of a lot to unpack there. But this meeting wasn't even uh, to discipline the employee or anything. And the company was kind of all flustered. What do we do? Should we let them have somebody there? Um, and no, th this isn't a deposition. It's not a court of law. This is a internal company meeting. Um, we can have HR there as a third party, right? Who's witnessing it to make sure nothing inappropriate happens. Um, but uh, employees cannot bring their own attorneys into work meetings. Um, they, they don't have a right to anyway. You could, you could let them, but you don't have to, and I wouldn't. Um, and, and, and think about that. What, what sort of story is this person showing? It, it is showing that they're difficult to work with, that, that um, you know, they won't even sign a, a form that just says this was reviewed with them, right? I, I'm sure most of your discipline forms. You're not asking the employee to say, I agree with everything you wrote. You're just saying, we discussed this. If you won't sign to say, we discussed it, uh, you know, it, it's actually going to help us down the road if, if things go south. Um, same thing if they get argumentative. You're in control. You're the boss. You should stay in control. Um, if the purpose is to get the employee back on track, then there's no reasons for, for tempers to flare and for it to get argumentative. Um, you can say clearly, um, you know, we're too emotional about this right now. I, I still need to finish this conversation, but let's do it tomorrow. Let's do it next week. Um, you know, you're the boss, stay in control. 
um, and think about what sort of story you're telling with this discipline meeting. If you're cool, calm, and collected and just there to try and help the employee, and the employee is argumentative and uh, making kind of these weird requests, uh, you know, we're going to come out ahead. This is what uh, your employment council's going to hope that, that you stayed cool, calm, and collected. Um, I think you guys know the positive benefits of, of uh, um, progressive discipline should correct the behavior. That's what we're going for. The past is the past. Um, but let's try and make the future better. It should be future and orientation. Uh, you need to force fairness and consistency. It also protects the company. Um, you know, from, from my point of view, that's one of the biggest benefits. And it also can help with unemployment cases. Uh, so how should we discipline? Uh, unfortunately, it's going to be a necessary part of working life. As long as we work with humans, humans are going to slip up from time to time. Uh, our goal should be to correct behavior, not to punish, uh, discipline in private, solicit feedback, utilize forms, uh, and back office support. So, um, you know, try and have your team use you as much as possible to make sure it's done properly. Uh, clearly communicate next steps if behavior isn't corrected. And uh, again, unfortunately, we do have to terminate when it's appropriate. Uh, performance reviews. This is uh, the next kind of main common mistake I'm seeing. Uh, there are a ton of reasons for it. This first uh, bullet point is a little more on the psychology of it. Uh, halo effect. People who we get along with, we tend to give better performance ratings to. Central tendency is uh, kind of the cop out. Everybody gets the same score. Uh, and recency effect. Hey, it might be a year long performance review, but uh, I'm only really reviewing you on the last six weeks. Um, those are three of the most common mistakes. Um, what, what do we need managers to do? Well, we need them to personalize the meeting, allow plenty of time, be themselves, create the proper climate, and most importantly, to be prepared. Uh, these performance review meetings are much more important than most managers realize, right? If, if you have 10, 15 performance reviews to do, Odds are you don't put enough time and thought into each one. Um, and it's unfortunate because this is the one time a year that your good employees really get sit down conversations with you, right? We spend most of our management capital. Uh, I said earlier the Jack Welsh, if you have five people, one all-star, three in the middle, uh, one, one lagging behind, we spend most of our management capital with those poor performers or, or uh, that one kind of troubled person on the team. We hardly sit down and talk with the all-star and even some of those people in the middle. So, uh, you know, have, have, have the respect for their time. They want to know how they are uh, in your eyes, how you view them. Um, and, and it is more important. It's a formal meeting. Um, the more formal, the more important uh, uh, an incident is, our brains actually benchmark it and we add more weight to it. We remember it longer. Um, I, I normally ask here if anybody's been in a car accident before. Um, I'll, I'll ask when the car accident was, you know, 10 years ago. Okay, what time of day was it? Um, it was in the morning. What'd you have for breakfast? What was the weather like? They can answer all of these pretty detailed questions. And if I say, uh, last Tuesday, what'd you have for breakfast and what was the weather like? Unless you had a big meeting that day or uh, some other important thing happened last Tuesday, you probably don't know. But 10 years ago, a car wreck you do. Uh, performance reviews, you know, on that scale aren't where car wrecks are, but this is a formal uh, process where we want to know how our company and our managers view us. Uh, you know, I, I, I can't stress that enough. Um, the manager be limiting uh, criticisms, three or four. If you give me a list of 15, 20 things to work on, I'm not going to do any of them. If you give me three things to work on, I can fix three things. And if you're honest with yourself, that list of 15, 20, it's really three to four things. And then everything else uh, is systemic uh, of those issues. 
So limiting criticism, people shouldn't leave this meeting feeling deflated. Nothing in the performance review should be new news, right? You, you need to address it when it happens. Uh, this is an overview of the whole year and should be future orientated. Again, uh, how, how can we move, move forward in the future? What goals do you have? How can I help you achieve those? Um, you know, th this is a good bonding time uh, if you use it right. But you need to involve the employee. Um, I've unfortunately, and I, I think most of us have been a part of performance reviews where the boss just uh, sits down and tells you a whole bunch of stuff and then you leave. Okay, uh, if my boss gives me goals to work on, I'm much less likely uh, to actually work on those and achieve it than I am, um, you know, if, if we come up with that together and if they're taking my considerations, am I, what are my, my goals at the company and in life um, and, and how can we work together um, to be successful. So involve the employee. You guys should come to a agreement at the end of performance reviews of, hey, these are the most important things to work on uh, over the next year or over the next quarter. Um, so can't, can't stress the importance of performance reviews enough. Um, you know, I, I was looking for the actual numbers here, um, but if, if you think about how often are performance reviews used in court, they're used a lot in court. It's, it's well over 80%. I think it's in the 90% by plaintiffs, right? And, and why is that? It's because we tend to inflate scores. We don't want to have those tough conversations. Uh, and even the worst employees in the company, we're still giving seven and a half out of 10 scores to on the year. Um, so hey, their plaintiff attorney can say, worked here 10, 15 years, never got less than a seven and a half. It's not their performance. They've been a great performer. Even if everybody in the company knows, no, they're the worst. We just, our performance reviews are always way too high, right? Um, I try and take the numerical grading out of it. This, this should be a conversation. This should be goal setting. It should be a SWOT analysis, right? Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities. Um, so performance reviews, uh, yeah, I think everybody uh, has, has opportunities to improve, to revamp, uh, try and make them uh, more, more important to the managers uh, and more effective uh, for the employees. Confidentiality, um, I tried to not talk about COVID really at all during this training, uh, but confidentiality is even more important now than ever. I mean, obviously we can't share people's personal health information. I've gotten a lot of calls. Well, Bill said he doesn't care if we say he's the one uh, who, who uh, you know, had the positive uh, test of COVID. Well, Bill can tell people, but we can't, right? We do have a duty to keep his health information private. Um, and, and I'll tell you, before uh, this pandemic happened, um, this summer I had a client more blue collar construction. Um, they had an employee who was terminated. He brought his truck into the shop. The truck was just trashed. There was, you know, food wrappers everywhere, loose papers, just completely trashed. The shop guys um, cleaned it out. And while they were cleaning it out, they found a doctor's note. The person had been tested for HIV AIDS, um, came back negative. But you better believe the guys in the shop, that spread like wildfire. They told everybody about it. It got to other departments. Somebody in a different department called this guy's ex-girlfriend and said, whoa, you better uh, be careful and go get tested. He has AIDS. I mean, you guys know how rumors go. Said negative. Now somebody's calling an ex-girlfriend uh, with private health information that should not have left that shop. Um, word did get back to the former employee. He did lawyer up. Um, and really, you can't stress enough how important confidentiality is, right? Um, you know, the leadership team at that company knew it, the HR team there knew it. Uh, but apparently, the guys in the shop and even some of the guys uh, in the office who continued to spread it. Um, you know, there, there really was a, a big fault on the part of the company there. 
um, to keep his health information private. So more important now than ever. Um, and it's just a matter of continuing to uh, discuss this with your team, make sure they, they know the importance of it. Um, what about legal concerns I'm seeing, uh, harassment? Um, I, I, I want to get through this and have time for questions. So I'm going to assume as HR professionals, uh, you guys understand that there is a new calculus uh, for employers. Um, I think in the 90s, even early 2000s, hey, the rainmakers at these companies, they could get away with whatever they wanted. The company would write a, a non-disclosure settlement agreement. They'd sweep it under the rug and that uh, rainmaker would keep their job. Uh, no better example of this to me than Bill O'Reilly at Fox News. He had the number one rated program on their show. And in cable news, ratings are, are king. And they said, no, we, we cannot be associated with you. This is too much. So something happened around that time frame. Um, and that was the beginning. Uh, I don't think Me Too was even a movement yet at, at that point of this new calculus and employers saying, no, um, I, I don't care who you are at the company, um, this won't be tolerated. And, and again, I think this is a great thing. Uh, in the past, we tolerated way more than we should have, and we shouldn't be sweeping these things under, under the rug and allowing some people to be above the law. So, um, you know, a, a lot of facts, uh, harassment, the culture, the industry you're in. Um, you know, I, I already talked about the two types, tangible employment action, hostile work environment. Uh, and the fact that, um, you know, with the tangible employment action, there are no employer defenses. Uh, another thing I see a lot is when managers do find out uh, about instances, they want to fly in like they're wearing a cape. They want to be the judge and jury uh, and be the one to pass judgment uh, from what they heard. And that is the absolute wrong way to handle it, right? We need human resources. We need um, a proper investigation. And if the manager who, who receives the complaint, and, and typically it does go to people's uh, immediate supervisor. As much as we ask people to go straight to HR or leadership, people are comfortable uh, reporting to the people who they work with. And we need to make sure our managers know you're not the judge and jury. You're not Superman here to save the day. Your job is to be professional, be compassionate, gather the information and report it up the chain. Um, and that really is being the superhero is if you can just get us the information uh, and allow us uh, to do a proper investigation. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll kind of in the training today, looks like we have about 10 minutes, which is perfect for Q and A um, with, with just the overview. My biggest takeaway in my short career so far has been the storytelling, right? What story does the company have? What story does the employee have? And if, if you can get that point across to your managers, um, maybe they can see the importance of taking those extra 10 seconds, those extra five minutes to document on behalf of the company. Um, you know, I urge all managers, whether you lead the HR department or uh, you, you know, anybody at a company, be a manager, be an employee of the future. Uh, be professional, take ownership uh, of the situation. Uh, be somebody who the company can count on. And when we're talking about discipline, do it in private, solicit feedback, use your back office, right? Use the forms and the resources they have for you. Um, performance reviews, it should be to make your life easier. If you can put a little more time and effort into them, um, you should be able to have a more meaningful experience, build trust with that employee, get them more motivated. Uh, that's the goal here. It should be future orientated. Uh, and then understanding just how important it is to quickly address complaints of harassment, discrimination, violence, those other serious types of allegations. Um, we really want an investigation to at least be started within 24 hours of notice. And that notice is the first supervisor who's told about it. Um, so again, thank you all for your time here today. I know I, I kind of went all over the place, but again, it was to hopefully leave you with 
uh, a tool, a new framework to, to have these discussions with people on your teams about. So uh, please reach out to me. Uh, I'd love to talk uh, with all of you uh, after it now or uh, anytime in the future. So it was my pleasure um, and, and I'll kick it back over to Stephen now. All right, thank you so much. I'm gonna start with, I think a question that you can't get more timely uh, with what we have going on right now, uh, especially lately, uh, but what is a safe way to inform an employee they have been exposed to COVID while protecting the COVID positive employee's health information? Yeah. Um... I, I just did this this morning, um, and and uh, you know I, I said I tried not to talk about COVID as much as as I could during the training, but I have a feeling the Q and A is going to have a lot of that. Um, you know, I I have a canned kind of templated response for my clients, but essentially the the steps I take first, you interview the person who tested positive or had potential exposure. Um, you try and determine who had close contact with them. Uh, the CDC just changed their definition of close contact. Um, so now it's 15 minutes within six feet uh, of total contact uh, with, within a 24 hour time frame from um, when the person knew, knew they uh, either tested positive or um, had symptoms. So 15 minutes isn't long, six feet, uh, and they don't take mask into consideration with that. Um, so I, I have a email essentially, um, says, you know, dear team, um, we had an instance of an employee, uh, testing positive for COVID-19. We have interviewed, uh, that individual and determined who they may have had close contact with, uh, paragraph about what close contact is. Cause a lot of employees, say, well, I, I know it was Jones and I, I, I was right next to Jones. Um, so kind of explaining the, the criteria we use and also explaining we can't release the individual's name. Uh, that's private information out of respect for them and uh, our employment laws. Uh, all we can do is interview them. Uh, if you guys have camera footage, you can try and uh, find it out that way. See who did have uh, close contact with the individual. Uh, and then the email basically says, we've already contacted those who were indicated may have had close contact. If you haven't heard from Mary or, uh, you know, whoever's in charge of HR, um, then it was indicated you didn't. But we do want to remind you, um, you know, to self-monitor, to continue to practice uh, safe hygiene, all of those things. Um, and then just kind of a closing paragraph and end it. So th that's my approach. Uh, I think that's a, a good professional way to do it. And unfortunately, if, if you haven't dealt with it yet, um, you know, it, the instances uh, with the clients that I've worked at are, are on the rise. So be prepared. All right. Another question here. What HR issues are you currently seeing more instances of? <laughs> Um, it, it's kind of weird. Um, you know, I, I've noticed a pattern throughout the years and the seasons, uh, you know, right now we're in the last quarter, everybody has a ton of work to do. There's a lot of uh, stress going on. Um, I, I, I see right now it's more, um, kind of that friction, of. Uh, between managers and employees because tensions are high, stressors are high. Um, oddly enough, at the start of the pandemic, around April, um, I started doing more sexual harassment investigations than I normally do in a year. And that didn't make any sense to me. I've since kind of wrapped my head around it that, you know, people had some time to, to sit at home and think about their work life uh, to, to maybe realize that some things were happening that should not have been happening. Um, and, and they finally had the courage to step up. One of the things we know about harassment is the vast majority goes unreported. So I, I think seeing that huge wave was a whole bunch of people who were uh, trying not to rock the boat um, initially, but they had some time to reflect about it. 
um, and they had the courage to step up and say, this isn't, this isn't right. Luckily for me, that, that's gone away the past couple of months. Um, more of those day-to-day -day employee conflicts, obviously COVID, a lot of ADA, um, you know, anxiety about coming to work, returning to work. Um, I haven't corresponded with doctors this much, you know, the, the first five years of my career combined as much as uh, I've done this year. So, yeah. I'm sure it's a lot of burnout anymore too. Yeah. Uh, another question here is, thinking about managers of the future, what other expectations do you have for what work will look like in 10, 20, 30 years? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I won't guess on, on 30 years, but, um, you know, it, it is going to become a more professional work environment. And I'm even seeing it at very blue collar, small mom and pop shops that, that they understand the importance of, um, we need to have policies in place. We need to treat people the same. Uh, we can't tolerate the jokes that, that we used to tolerate, um, we need to protect the company. So um, professionalism, um, treating work as, um, you know, you, you should be treated well while you're there. Uh, you shouldn't be subjected uh, to things that maybe we allowed uh, people to be subjected to in the past. Yeah. Any others? Just one more so far. Uh, and of course, if everybody wants to chime in real quick, they're more than welcome to. But what have been your best and worst experiences in HR? Yeah, well, we, we might need a lot more time uh, for the worst one. Um, <laughs> uh, I, the first big client I ever brought on in my career um, was not a good company. It was a third generation owner. The, the owner uh, drove a Corvette and an Audi A8 to his designated front row parking spot, alternated every other day. It was the different $100,000 car. Um, and they really hired me to do a lot of layoffs. So um, I, I came in and I saw people who'd worked at this company for longer than I'd been alive, 30, 40 years, um, be let go. And think about the narrative that's telling when the, the boss's car costs, you know, what these people make in three years of working for him. And he's got two of them. Uh, and he's letting them all go uh, instead of taking a hit personally first. So that really taught me it, it matters who you work with. Um, and, and I've tried to align myself with people who have my values uh, ever since that point in time. Uh, in the best, um, you know, there are a lot of good high moments, um, you know, clients winning awards, things like that. A good one that just happened a couple of weeks ago, a new client of mine, we did an employee survey. Um, one of the things they all said was they wanted more time off. Uh, it's a professional services firm that had two weeks of PTO, uh, and that was it for everybody at the company. Um, we instituted a policy. Um, a holiday policy where they get Christmas Eve through New Year's off, uh, basically added 50% more paid time off. Uh, and I just started working with them two months ago and we had that meeting last Friday uh, and just seeing how happy their employees were that, you know, we were heard. Uh, one of the main things we asked for, we got uh, almost instantly uh, and it's coming up soon, right? We're, we're only a little over a month away from that. So um, th that was a fun, a fun moment. I bet it was, especially anymore. Uh, that looks like it was our last question. Thank you, Brian, so much for hosting today. And thank you all for joining us again. HRCI insurance credit information, as well as the slides, will be emailed to all eligible attendees within 24 hours. Uh, and if some of you are like me, you prefer one-on-one -on -one questions and engagement, uh, the email will include a way of contacting Brian if you should have any questions. Well, and I hope you do. Uh, I'd love to hear from you guys. Our 
next webinar is employment screening trends for 2021, a year in forecast. Uh, this is always a big hit, especially I'm sure with some of the regulations and uh, legalizations that occurred just a few weeks ago. Uh, an email invite will be going out shortly with a link to register. Uh, and you can currently register through our website at validityscreening.com. On behalf of both Brian and myself, thank you everyone for joining us. Have a great day and a better weekend. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye.